Let's have a look at how to implement a PID controller in software. Firstly, we'll look at what PID controllers are, why they are useful, and why we'd want to implement them using software. Then we'll briefly look at how to convert from a continuous time PID controller representation to a discrete time one, which will be used for the final software implementation. We'll also look at several practical considerations and how to adjust the PID controller to fit real world systems and needs. Most importantly, we'll go over the actual PID controller implementation written in C. Lastly, we'll have a look at the PID controller code in action, controlling a simulated dynamical system. In general, PID controllers are used to control an uncertain system via feedback. More specifically, you want a system to track a set point or a reference um, by letting the controller adjust the signal going into the system. The controller uses the set point and feedback to generate this control signal, where the feedback is generally a measurement acquired by a sensor. Take for example, albeit a boring and rather simple one, that of an oven. The oven has a temperature dial, um, the set point, and a sensor which can provide a measurement of the current temperature in the oven. The oven's controller combines these two bits of information to turn the heating element in the oven on or off. If the measured temperature is lower than the set point, the heater is on, turned on. If the measured temperature is higher than the set point, the heater is turned off. Now, the systems we encounter typically function in continuous time. For example, a fighter jet or the cruise control in a car. It is, however, very beneficial to implement PID controllers discreetly in software. Digital systems typically are far more robust, cheaper, and far easier to reprogram. This is why essentially all modern control systems are digitally implemented. Now the question is how we can write the PID controller as an algorithm that can run in software. Now before we start with the derivation, however, let me say that for the deriv derivation, I expect you to be familiar with the plus and Z transforms and will not be covering these topics here for the sake of time. Uh, there are really many resources on and offline, so I recommend you just do a quick Google search on S or Z domain and Z transforms or plus transforms. If you aren't familiar with these topics, that's no problem at all. The important part of this video is the actual implement implementation code, so feel free to skip ahead. Okay, but let's have a look at the continuous time version of the PID controller in the S or Laplace domain. Uh, now, this is the form given in the majority of control theory textbooks. As said before, the controller has two uh, inputs, the set point or the reference, and the measurement, which is fed back via sensor. Now, if we subtract the set point from the measurement, so set point minus measurement, we get the error term, uh, typically denoted with an E. Um, now, this error signal is fed through the controller to generate a control signal, which is usually denoted via a U. Uh, this error term goes through three paths in this PID controller. The first is the proportional path. Uh, the error term is simply multiplied by a constant, uh, usually denoted K subscript P or KP. This is the proportional gain. The second path is the integral path. The error is multiplied by the integral gain KI and then summed or integrated. This is denoted in the S domain by one over S. The final path is this derivative path. Essentially, the error signal is multiplied by another gain, KD, the derivative gain, and then the rate of change of the error is calculated at the current point in time. Now, something we'll look at again later, but is curious to see here, is the addition of this low pass filter. So we multiply the error term by the derivative gain, we take the derivative, but then we also filter that term. Now the filter can be moved ahead in this linear system, it doesn't matter. But the important thing is that we'll actually be filtering the derivative term for reasons that will become clear later on. Okay, so finally the results of these three paths, the proportional, the integral, and the derivative path are summed to give the final control signal. This control signal is then passed to the input of the system we wish to control. Um, okay, so here we've had the continuous domain representation. Let's see how we can convert that to a discrete time representation. 
Okay, we need a way of converting from continuous time to discrete time, so that we can finally arrive at a difference equation. Now, a difference equation is something we can very easily implement in code. So difference equations typically only consists of, consist of multiplications and additions. One very effective way of converting from continuous time to discrete time, or the S domain to the Z domain, is via the use of the Tustin transform, sometimes also called the bilinear transform. This will give us um, guaranteed stability if the original system is stable, and also a best frequency domain match. Simply put, the way to do this is every time you see an S in the transfer function, so back here, every time you see an S, replace that, or substitute, with this whole block over here. So 2 over t times z minus 1 over z plus 1. And this is actually the Tustin transform. Note here that t, capital T, is the sampling time of the discrete controller in seconds. So once you've substituted that, we are now in the discrete domain, but we have to then convert it to a difference equation. And the way we do that is we re recall that multiplying by z is the same as a time shift by one sample. Okay, so I did this all, all the substituting and arranging, and a lot of, after a lot of that, uh, we can finally arrive at the final difference equation. And this again, as before, can be broken up into three terms, just like the PID controller itself. So we have a proportional term, we have an integral, integrator term, and a derivative term. Now the proportional term is unchanged. We multiply the error term, E of n, by a constant, Kp, which is the a proportional gain. The integral term uh, shows maybe a bit more clearly that the current value is some form of summation. So we're summing the previous two error terms and it's also dependent on the previous integral term. Now the derivative term, as you can see here by the subtract subtraction, uh, looks at the difference of the error term across samples. As before, we sum the outputs of the three paths over here to get the final controller output u of n. Again, we sum the proportional term, we sum the integral term, and we sum the derivative term to arrive at the controller output u of n. Now, in theory, the difference equations we see here and the summation uh, are ones that we could directly implement in software. However, there are a couple of important points I would like to mention that mean we have a bit more work to do for a PID controller that will actually behave itself in the real world. So let's have a look at them now. So here's a short list of practical considerations, and we'll go through them one by one. Firstly, the derivative term, without filtering, strongly amplifies high-frequency noise. So the frequency response of taking the derivative is essentially an infinitely increasing slope upwards, which you can see here. Uh, the way we can combat this is to low-pass filter the signal before taking the derivative, or after, either way is fine. Uh, so this filter was shown, if you recall, in one of the first slides. So this is the filter I'm talking about here in this path. So if you look at the overall frequency response here, this is the frequency response of a derivative. This is the frequency response of the low-pass filter. And the combined response is this one here. And you see um, now the high-frequency noise isn't as strongly amplified as before. The problem with this is that this filter in turn diminishes the effect of the derivative control. And quite honestly, derivative control is generally avoided in the real world control systems if it can be. But this is still something we do to, to mitigate the effects of the high frequency noise amplification. Another problem with the derivative term is that it produces a rather large kick during the set point change. So imagine you, you, you quickly have an impulse change or a step change in the set point. Now, the derivative of a step change is an impulse, and that will give this nasty kick. One way to get around this is by using derivative on measurement. So instead of taking the, the derivative of the error signal, we simply take the derivative of the fed back measurement um, acquired by the sensor. So the end result is the same, except we don't have that kick anymore. Okay, so that's the two main problems with the derivative term. Let's move on to the integrator. A large problem with the integrator term is that it can saturate the output. This is typically, typically termed integrator windup. Now, to combat this, the imaginative name is integrator anti-windup, and loosely this is some form of clamping. It's necessary, to, again, to prevent the integral from reaching excessively large values when the control signal is already at its maximum possible value for an extended period of time. 
For the code implementation, this is achieved by a dynamic integrator anti windup, and I'll link to that in the description and go a bit more detail when we look at the code. Another quite simple but often overlooked aspect is that the controller output needs to be constrained to maximum and minimum values it can take. For example, in an aircraft, the rudder can only deflect by a certain maximum angle. If the controller demands a larger angle uh, than is possible, well, there'll be trouble. And a simple way to mitigate that is just to clamp the controller output. Lastly, and I think quite importantly, is how do we actually choose a proper sample time of the controller? So how many times do we update the controller output? We want our control system to be able to react quick enough to changes occurring in the system. So a good rule of thumb is to have the controller have a 10 times higher bandwidth than that of the system it is controlling. So now we're, we're almost ready to take a look at the final impl implementation in software, but let's loosely define the code structure before that though. So I'm, I'm quite fond of single header libraries and I believe so are embedded systems. So everything will be contained in 1.h and 1.c file, which we can simply include like this. We'll also make use of a C struct to store our controller gains and also um, some sort of memory variables, variables for controller memory and so forth. In effect, we'll only need two large functions. One is to initialize the controller to set the gains, set the sample time and so forth. And one is to actually update the controller. So we'll pass to the function the set point and the measurement. And that function will then compute the P, I and uh, D terms and return that controller output. So once we then have that controller output, we can somewhere else in the code forward that on to the system we want to control. All right, so let's move over now to the actual implementation and let's briefly run through that. Now we're ready to actually implement the PID controller in C code. I've already pre-written parts of the C code, so I've made a header file and a source code file C, um, PID.C, but we'll fill in the update function of the PID controller together since that's the most interesting part. Now, um, what I'm using is a struct for the PID controller to store things such as the controller gains, derivative low pass filter, time constants, output limits, sample times, and so on. And I'm also using it to, to store persistent um, variables, so something we'll need to reuse in our calculations. And this is primarily the integrator and the differentiator. As we said before, the PID controller consists of two main functions. One is the initialization, essentially to reset the controller, and one is the update function, uh, which actually computes the controller output. Uh, we could also use the initialization function to pass in the gains and uh, the limits and so forth, but you can initialize a struct as it is, so I've left that out. Okay, so let's briefly remind ourselves what we actually need to be doing. All we have to do is implement these three terms here, the p, proportional integral, and derivative term, and then sum them together to compute the output. So that's fairly straightforward. What we also need to take into account is, of course, the practical considerations. So we have the derivative filter, all this uh, derivative on measurement stuff, integrator anti windup, and so on. But we'll go through that fairly briefly now. You can see here the initialization function just resets uh, the controller variables. But uh, what we're interested in is the update function. Now, the update function takes the PID controller struct, it takes the set point value or the reference, and it also takes the measurement, which we will get via feedback from the plant's output or the system's output. Uh, this function then returns a float, which is the controller output. So first of all, we need to calculate the error signal. The way we do that, a new variable, and the error signal is simply the set point minus the measurement. Now, once we have that, we can calculate the proportional term is simply the proportional gain times the error. Uh, I'm using this to access the gain since we're passing this um, PID control struct as a pointer. So this is basically what I just did now. The proportional term is the proportional gain times the error. Now, something more interesting is the integral term. The integral term is a bit more involved, as you can see here. So let me just transfer that over from code. So we're saying the integrator is essentially the previous value of the integrator plus the new term, which is the gain times the sampling time times the sum of the previous errors. So I could have used plus equals here and gotten rid of this, but I find it a bit clearer if I write it like this. So it's the, the current integrated term is dependent on the previous one plus this new term here. Okay, you can see this variable here, prev error, is essentially the previous error from the previous iteration of this function. 
So at the end of this function, we will store the error term in PID previous error. But we'll get to that a bit later. One thing I've already filled in here is the anti windup scheme from the integrator. And this is essentially just figuring out the limits we need to set on the integrator uh, as to not uh, saturate the output and make it, make it overdrive, so to speak. I'll put a link in the description to where I got this from. It's called dynamic integrator clamping. The last thing we have to do is then actually clamp the integrator. So we are, this part is used to figure out the limits we need to set on the integrator. And now we actually have to limit the integrator value. So we have calculated the integrator value up here. We've calculated the limits here. Then we need to say if the integrator value is larger than the calculated limit, uh, we set the integrator to that limit. And of course, we have to do the same thing for the lower limit. So if the integrator value is less than the lower limit, we have to set the integrator to the lower limit. Okay, now that's that done. So that is essentially the whole integrator term here, plus we've done the integrator and wind up. And again, I'll put the link to that in the description. Now, the next interesting term is the derivative term. Another form for it, because we're cascading it with a low-pass filter, it's usually called a band-limited differentiator. Okay, so let's remind ourselves again what that looks like. It's this whole term over here. Now, let me quickly write that out. Or actually, let me just copy it from my notepad file over here. So I split it up in three terms, but they're all assigned to the, the differentiator. Remember, this is derivative on measurement. So we're actually not doing the derivative on the error signal, which we calculated up here, but rather we're actually taking the measurement and the previous measurement. This prev measurement term is similar to the prev error term as in that we will store in the measurement term in the prev measurement term at the end of the function. But essentially all this is doing is implementing this function over here. Additionally, we are avoiding derivative kick during the setpoint change by doing derivative on measurement. So this is why we're doing this thing here. So now we've done the proportional term, we've done the integral term, and we've done the derivative term. All that is left is now to sum all of these terms and compute the output. So it's proportional plus the integrator term plus the differentiator term. One thing, of course, we said as well is that we have to limit the system input amplitude or limit the controller output. So that's what we'll do here. If the proportional output or the controller output is larger than the limit we set for the controller, again, we just set it equal to that limit. And same for the lower bound. Now, the lim max and lim, term, lim min terms are set by the user of this controller just to clamp the output, and that's stored in the struct as well. Okay, as I said before, we have these prev error and prev measurement terms, and now we have to assign the current measurement and current error terms to these variables so that we can use them the next iteration of the loop. So we do say prev error is the error, and then prev measurement is the measurement. And finally, all that is left to do is return the PID output. And that is essentially the essence of this PID control function. So we compute the error signal, we compute the proportional term, we com uh, compute the integral term, use anti windup methods to limit the, the amplitude of the integral term. Then we calculate the, the band limited differentiator, so a differentiator with a low pass filter. We sum all the terms, P plus I plus D. We limit the output and we store variables for future use. And then we just return the PID controller's output. So here's a slightly more interesting example. This is a flight simulator I wrote, and I also have a video on that if you'd like to go into more detail of how this thing works. I've written it in Unity, and of course I can't use C code in Unity, so I've converted the PID controller functions to a C sharp code, and this is this file over here. What it is doing is actually controlling the attitude of the aircraft with PID controllers using the one control system we just wrote. I've got assisted mode here, so I can essentially give it this aircraft a set point, and it'll try and follow this. So I can make it roll, make it pitch, and so forth. And all this is achieved via the use of PID control and simulated sensors. I can also switch this into autonomous mode, where it'll try and climb to, um, for example, a fixed altitude. You'll see here, it's trying to climb to 100 meters. So let's actually go that down a bit. Let's make it go to 55 meters, and you'll see the PID controller re reacts appropriately and makes sure the altitude is about 55 meters. You can do the same thing for the airspeed and so on. 
And yeah, so this is just to show that the PID controller does indeed work, does indeed do its job, and that you can use it to control variety with dynamical systems. Well, I hope you liked the video, and um, please do leave me a comment if you have any questions. Thank you.